go away. Um, okay, so let's just start and we'll enjoy each other's company and uh, the others have come in afterwards. So my name is Randy Labonte. I'm uh, with Canadian eLearning Network, which actually started at the uh, in iNACL, which was the predecessor to DLAC. Uh, we were meeting and we did Birds of a Feather. We did Metis Canadians uh, in the event for blended and online is what iNACL had uh, was carrying the, the charge then. Uh, and uh, we decided we would stop spending so much money to come and meet each other, although as pleasant as it was to come to the US and some of the locations that were chosen, it was like, mm, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So why don't we try and do something in Canada? So we actually then formed the Canadian e-learning uh, network or Canny Learn. We started with Canny Learn uh, and then had to formalize it, but, uh, and we were very dependent uh, and support from folks like Matt Wicks, who was with iNACL, Alison Powell, who was with iNACL at the time, and others to help us sort of sort out what it is that we should be and where we should go. So uh, the history continues now, obviously, with a connection with John and now Allison back from Bloomboard into here, as well as the rest of who they've attracted. And John has come uh, kindly and graciously to a number of events that we've had in Canada as well. So we have this uh, affiliation and connection, which I think is really important, but that's sort of the network as it is. So uh, let me stop sharing and we'll get the checkerboard. And if you don't mind introducing yourselves, um, we'll go around the room for that. So uh, we'll do the room in a, in, a, in a bit, but why don't we start with John, then Claude, then Michael, and then Frank. And we have a guest. Good morning, my name is John Proctor. I'm originally from the UK. I am the Executive uh, Director of the Ontario Wheel Learning Consortium. Uh, and I am uh, meeting you all today from the uh, lands of uh, Greater Essex, um, which are traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Claude Pierre-Louis. So I work for the Cavalfo, which is a e-learning consortium, but for the uh, French uh, population. So we represent uh, 12 uh, school boards. Nice to meet you. And my name is Frank McCallum. I'm the associate principal for Avista Virtual School, which is a province-wide online virtual school in the province of Alberta. I'm also the chair of the Canny Learn Board, and I'm coming to you from uh, uh, Calgary, Alberta, which is a Treaty 7 region of this province. And I'm Michael Barber. I'm a professor of instructional design at uh, Troy University, California. And uh, basically, I've been one of the, I guess, founding members of, of Canny Learn. And also, uh, I manage a uh, Pan Canadian Research Project that Canny Learn has been partnered with for the last decade. Oh, thanks. Uh, and we have a guest. If you uh, don't know what your first name is, but uh, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, either grab the mic or just text in the chat for folks uh, here as well. So uh, around the the room, if that's okay with you, uh, why don't we start over in the back corner? Hi, uh, David. At TLA online in uh, <clears throat> North Mainland, British Columbia. I'm the operations officer, so I'm not a teacher, but just here to learn more stuff. Welcome, David. Thank you. Karen. Uh, I'm Karen. I live in the Lower Mainland as well. I'm the director of middle school instruction for Heritage Christian Online, and I also do some sessional teaching and course writing for Trinity Western University in Queens. Um, I do some of the research to inform my course writing. Perfect. So we're just doing introductions. Welcome. Sorry, what's your name? Vince Natoli. Sorry, what was the Vince Natoli with FOBS button? Welcome, Vince. Sorry. I'm Kimmy Ward, Director of Online Learning for Oklahoma City Public Schools. Excellent. Thanks. Um, and I'm Cabrera from the Florida Virtual School. Okay, and last, Christine. I'm uh, Chrissy Canitas. I am the Senior Director of Quality and Compliance at Florida Virtual School at West Point. Awesome. And we have Katrina Springford from Parkland College, New York, to Saskatchewan. I don't think you can, well, I didn't broadcast that. So, um, so she's here as well uh, joining us. Um, 
so thank you folks thanks for being here um and one of the things that's important for us in canada we do this a lot which is the land acknowledgement um and so the the place where kenny learns head office is situated happens to be synonymous with my house home office kind of thing but it's on the the traditional lands of the yourself uh, on in the coastal sunshine coast area if you know vancouver those from the lower mainland know uh, it is on the mainland of North America, but you take a ferry to get there, and it's a 40-minute ferry. Um, but the uh, Salish folks, uh, including the Shishalf, have been very um, now directly involved in the economy of this local area. It's a rural community in the sense that most of us grab the ferry to go big box shopping uh, in Vancouver, which is only 40 minutes away. Um, but it is uh, also a privilege to be a part of the, the lands there. Uh, so this is a little bit about the network that we are. We have some sort of purposes that we have uh, thrashed around and focused on, but basically it's a network uh, to support, to share, and basically build communications uh, between and amongst uh, those of us that are part of it. Uh, and so we do have some events that we do uh, sponsor ourselves but largely we partner with the other provincial events. Um, so making that a little bit easier. So we did launch and that's a picture, that's an older picture of uh, when we were at York University uh, in one of the, the early days in terms of building uh, the, the piece. But we do want to advocate for what's happening, particularly after our experiences with remote learning. And you know, as everyone has had as well here in, in the US, some of it was, Okay, some of it was detrimental, but overall we're hoping it's gonna be much better. So what we're hoping uh, around here is to sort of get a sense about what it is that you, you would like to see uh, that you've come here for, um, so, and what you would hope to learn, because again, this is a 75 minute, we don't wanna bore you if there's other things, if we can get it done faster, we certainly would respect your time uh, for doing that. So. What are, you, what are you hoping for? What are you looking for as part of the reason why you're here? And how can we sort of make that happen? And I'm gonna ask you uh, online panel folks to take notes of that so that you can respond. I'll just facilitate the conversation. Anyone want to jump in on that? I'm here to see how you guys do teacher evaluations. Okay, teacher evaluations. There's a good one. Maybe just a general understanding of how virtual learning works in Canada. My um, husband was born in Canada and children that have dual citizenship. So there's always the conversation about do we live here or do we live in Canada? For me, I'm interested, especially since we've got a really good cross section of different parts of Canada, how um, strategies may differ depending on geographic region, for example. Um, and by the way, for those, I, I introduced myself as I came in early, but I'm Dr. Reese. I'm a residential faculty at Mexican Community College in Arizona. Okay, anyone else? Well, we do have some folks in the room that can share as well from uh, HCOS and Kelly, and not to pick out a blind, <laughs> sorry, on, on, on the spot there. But um, so fair enough. So just to brought the general overview. So maybe what we, the best thing to do, and, and, and Michael, you're, if you're okay with it as being co-host and sort of director of the, mo the folks online, uh, if we just do sort of our, our piece, our shtick and go across the country. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So this is over to you and I'll just sort of move ahead on the slides as you're doing it. Actually, what we can probably do, given what I heard from the, the audience there, um, it might be just best to mention that you will have a poster uh, about this and have the opportunity to sort of talk about what's uh, happening in, at a national level and across the provinces because most of the comments I heard there seem to be things that I think our program leaders that are in the room might be able to better address so if you want to skip this and then uh, we can always come back to it at the end if, if we have time. Yes so th this was the cue I remember that I use this slide just to say there is no national agenda for K-12 education in our country. <laughs> and that's kind of important 
and every <laughs> province and territory is a silo. There are connections like, and, but there's better, there's state consortiums. So there are, you know, and you've got the VL, LA, et cetera. So we are the fledgling of connecting for the online programs in Canada. And I have to say on that note, we don't do a very good job because we're just not large enough population wise or size wise as an organization. Uh, Michael, anything else you want to add in or Frank, maybe I, I didn't mean to take the chair of the board's um, words away. Not at all, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fired yet, okay. <laughs> So, so Michael, over to you. Um, well, basically, the when you look at the, the the cross Canada perspective, it's actually very much for those of you from the U.S. It, it's similar to what you find in the U.S. There are some uh, jurisdictions that have uh, province-wide programs, similar to statewide uh, initiatives. In many cases, they're supplemental, like you'd see in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of district-based activity, particularly as you get into to Western Canada, and then a lot of jurisdictions that have some combination of, of the two. Um, and they, what's sort of happening lately is you're starting to see a greater movement towards centralization uh, uh, across the country. Um, go ahead there, Randy. No, no, that's fine. No, I mean, go to the next slide. Oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Unlike what you find in the US, in most cases, the regulatory environment isn't structured in a way that is legislative in nature. So in many cases in the US, um, digital learning or distance learning have been brought into legislation, usually in the mid 2000s, early uh, 2010, 2015 ish type time frame, uh, often time because of bills that were created by um, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and passed in various legislatures. Uh, in Canada, while distance education is mentioned in legislation, usually it's one line that says, the minister shall have the authority to regulate distance learning. And that's usually the only bit of legislative information that you find about distance education um, in, in that particular jurisdiction. Uh, two outliers with that are Nova Scotia and BC. In BC, there is a very extensive uh, legislative re regime that is put in place. Uh, and in the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually built into their collective agreement that they have with their teachers union. Um, so there's a, a specific uh, section that has, if I remember correctly, it's 13 individual clauses that focus on it. Um, so as you can see, most jurisdictions either use policy handbooks that are put out by uh, the ministry, or they have memorandums of understanding. And in many cases with the MOUs, it's usually between the ministry and the school districts as a way for them to um, use, the, um, use the materials that the ministry is providing. I'll go ahead with the next slide, Randy. Um, like what you see in the U.S., we've seen uh, growth for a, a considerable amount of time, although you'll notice really from about 2011 up until 2020, um, basically we were in that 5% to 6% range. So it was sort of bubbling around there. Um, unlike what you find in the U.S., we don't have good counts in Canada uh, because many of the jurisdictions rely upon district-based programs. Um, and, and they're not schools with school identification codes like you find in a lot of U.S. jurisdictions. Um, while we stopped using the tilde and the ranges after the first couple of years, the reality is while we give a very specific number, that very specific number could be off by as much as uh, 10 to 15 percent, uh, to be honest with you, because in many jurisdictions, we just don't have a good sense as to what's uh, happening there. Um, we're confident that the number is a minimum number. Uh, so we can say that, you know, there's a minimum of roughly 400,000 uh, people that were uh, learning in online and distance programs as of the end of last year, which represents about seven and a half percent of the population. Um, it could be much more than that. In fact, I would estimate that it could be as much as 12 to 13 percent, to be perfectly honest. Go ahead, Randy. As you can see, looking at the province by province, some provinces are much more engaged in this than others. Um, if you look out to the Western provinces, all those ones that uh, where we had just provincial or just district-based programs, 
Um, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC in particular, you can see are much higher than what the national average is. Uh, you can see most of Atlantic Canada are lower than what the national average is. And um, you've got central Canada that's coming close to roughly where the national average is. Um, but you get a sense as to where folks are. Um, the one that you're going to see a, a big difference in is Ontario. And I'm sure John and Claude will talk about this when they uh, grab their spots. But uh, a couple of years ago, there is a optional mandatory graduation requirement uh, that they will discuss in, in uh, a bit. Um, but it means that you could have a potential for as many as 300 and 60,000 students a year in Ontario taking an online course if everyone were to actually go by the, if everyone were to do the mandatory part of the optional mandatory part. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, go ahead there, Randy. One of the things that we noticed this particular year, and this is actually the first year we've had this table in the report, and by the way, we've been doing the report for 15 years, so, um, and for those of you from the U.S., it's kind of like, it actually started out as one of the keeping pace reports, or a style of that, a Canadian version of that. Um, for those of you that are newer to the field, they're the snapshot reports that John and his team do now. Um, this is the first time we've had this particular table, and the reason why we, we included it this year was... Um, if you look particularly with um, Ontario, Quebec, uh, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, um, you can see that in the past three years, so in, in the pandemic, um, there's a dramatic increase in the number of programs. And Ontario is the really the, the big one there. Uh, you can see that they had roughly you know 70 or so um, programs. And the drop from 81 to 70 was because we used to count all of the districts that uh, the school boards that participated in Claude's program as individual programs and we started in 2019 2020 counting them as a single program because that's kind of how they've always operated um, but you can see that the number of programs has jumped by um, really you know 100 roughly 170 new programs that are in there and the vast majority of those are private providers that have come on the scene to try to take advantage of this um, e-learning graduation requirement that they've got there um, at West, you've seen a, an increase in the number of programs as well. Um, I think that's largely due to the pandemic, although Frank will talk a little bit about some of the changes in Alberta uh, that have um, spurred on some of the growth there. And uh, in the case of Quebec, they actually have a bunch of pilot programs that are currently running um, based on a piece of legislation that was passed three years ago, and they finally have got uh, some programs up and operational. Uh, you can go to the next one there, Randy. And that's basically uh, gives you a rough idea of the overview. So we'll just get into the nature of activity now and starting in with the groups. And I think I'm the first because I'm the Pilkin Atlantic Canadian being a native Newfoundlander. Um, as you can see, the Atlantic Canada, all the provinces are centralized programs. So these are programs that in most cases are run directly out of the Ministry of Education. Um, even uh, PEI there, which is in green, um, that's a map from two years ago. It's, it's ready, actually it's striped red now, kind of like the way the Northwest Territories are uh, because they're just developing their own program and they also use programming from New Brunswick. Uh, but in all of these instances, they oftentimes are only getting two to 3% of the folks. Uh, it's a program that's run out of the Ministry of Education, primarily targeting secondary uh, students. Um, the program in Newfoundland is highly synchronous, whereas the program in the uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick is almost completely asynchronous. Uh, the one they're developing in PEI is actually a video-based one, so that's going to be highly synchronous as well. Um, and I will turn it over to whoever is doing uh, Quebec next, and then I think it goes oh. to Claude and Jean. Uh, I don't know, Claude, if you want to say anything about Quebec or just let me say something about Quebec and Michael to chime in. Go ahead, Randy, for, for Quebec. So, so what's interesting about Quebec, uh, one of the founding chairs and uh, mentor and leader, certainly, is in the Anglophone. So uh, in Canada, there's it's a bilingual country, and we have a couple of bilingual, you know, two-language provinces. But for those of, my last name is Levante, which is French and derived from that. But, I mean, past the Rockies, no one speaks French. Uh, so I've never was raised learning French, I actually chose to learn German. Um, so, but what happens in Quebec is that the learn anglophones 
are the minority language. So they have some federal funding and that was part of the whole confederation and everything else that happened in the same way as that the Western provinces and others who are pr primarily English speaking have some funding to support the French language, which then comes into the education system. However, the education systems are dominated and run by the ministry's uh, pr provincial entities. So the distribution of those funds are dependent to a certain extent on the decisions made in the province. So in, uh, so in Quebec though, the Anglophones uh, learn have created a whole online series. So they've embraced online completely. Whereas in the Francophone communities and education system, it's not as well embraced. As a matter of fact, it is actually almost publicly spoken about as being a second choice and lower, less uh, viable option for, for students, even through the pandemic when they had parents that were Frank, French parents that were, were sort of pushing on them. I don't know, Michael, if there's anything else that we can say out of school. <laughs> Um, well, the only other thing I might add is, and it follows up on what Randy was talking about, but this notion of it being a second class or second rate uh, type of education. Uh, Quebec is also home to the only court case that we've had around online learning in Canada, which is uh, uh, a bit unique in our context, because in, in the U.S. there are oftentimes dozens each year. Uh, as you're looking across the spectrum, but uh, it was basically a group of parents in Montreal that wanted an online learning option for their kids and sued the government to try to get that um, and ultimately failed uh, in their quest. So, so Quebec is to a certain extent operates on a sort of somewhat different set of rules or assumptions in, in the, the country and has had a history of um, being a, an angry child, how about that? <laughs> sometimes wanting to be there, sometimes not wanting to be a part of it. Uh, wants the candy, but you know doesn't want the, the rest of it, so to speak. Anyway, so I, I, I'm gonna stop there before I get into trouble. So John and or Claude, or both, <laughs> Ontario. You're uh, muted, uh, John. It had to happen at least once by one of us. Uh, Can you put your camera back on? Sorry, because otherwise we won't pick you up in the recording. Um, on camera. I think you might have to click on the... Yeah, I'm going to have to go on the arrows. Yeah, I was going to say, he's on camera there on our end, Randy. Okay. My bad. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so uh, Randy, if you want to move on to the Ontario timeline. Um, Ontario has been through uh, an interesting time uh, the past three years, uh, as you probably, uh, you may be aware. Um, March 2019, the province announced um, that four credits were going to be mandatory. So in Ontario, you have to get 30 credits to graduate. Um, and initially, um, our um, minister at the time said four credits. That was quickly walked back. Uh, actually, within two weeks, there was a change of minister. Um, and within two weeks, they then announced that it was only going to be two mandatory credits. So we're still there. We've still got two mandatory credits, um, which was really, really good. Um, obviously, the unions got involved. A couple of parent groups got involved. Uh, there was some really poor research from a, a really small sample group of 23 students uh, that the Toronto Sun publicized quite a lot. And because of that additional pressure, um, when we got to November of 2019, those mandatory credits now became optional mandatory credits. <laughs> So we were sort of in a, a, a strange situation. In terms of, of the graduation requirement, it is still there, um, but all parents can opt out. It is the only mandatory requirement that has an opt out uh, without any special conditions. Um, we do have one other that has an opt out, but the special conditions that uh, have to be in place for that. And it's also the only one that doesn't need a principal approval. Uh, it only needs parental approval. What was seen by all this, though, was the government's move really to try and centralize um, the whole of the e-learning process. They wanted to centralize seat reservation. They wanted to centralize um, course development. And they wanted initially to centralize the teaching and learning that was taking place as well. 
Um, we have a, a large organization over here called TBO TFO. TBO is the English speaking side, TFO the French. And the idea was initially that they were going to take care of all of this. And they uh, received somewhere in the region of $60 million to be able to provide all that solution. That wasn't good. It wasn't received well. Uh, and a lot of people saw that as a pathway to privatization. Um, we have some fantastic organizations in Ontario. Um, I know I have personal bias in this, but the OELC is one of them, Cavill Flow is another. Um, CVO, which is the Catholic Virtual Ontario Group, is another. So we all made representations, um, and those representations actually started to get some headway. Uh, the government realized actually that they could probably get this done a little bit cheaper uh, by using what was already there. And um, I think that was really the, the moving influence. So we're in May, thanks Randy. Um, by October, we got to the process of consultation. Um, so this was the whole PPM. So within um, Ontario, you have laws and then underneath that, you've got policy program memorandums, which are effectively rules issued by the minister. So PPM 167 was the beginning uh, of what mandatory optional e-learning was gonna look like. Uh, in Ontario. The crucial part, and thankfully, because we had so much support from the employers, um, which is um, the Ontario Public School Board Association and the Ontario Catholic School Board Trustees, <clears throat> they really did pressurize the government to move away from the centralized platform. So by December of 2021, so next one down, Randy. Oh, we'd actually managed to secure um, a decentralization, a, a re recognition that we were best practice, a recognition that we could provide the services that weren't gonna be able to provide by TVO. Not least to say there was no way that TVO could develop a seat reservation system that was as powerful as the ones that we use within the short period of time that they needed to actually produce them. So we come to February of uh, last year when the policy and program memorandum was released, uh, PPM 167, um, which then had all the details. The interesting part is that PPM 167 specifies that online learning would be teacher-led, but could be asynchronous. Reason why I say that is, you know, there was one specific question there about teacher evaluations, and one of the things that, uh, as an organisation, and this is just the OELC, which is the English speaking part of Ontario, what we actually ask is that all of the people who work within our organisation, so from all of the boards, um, provide thirty percent synchronous opportunities. That's a key part as far as we're concerned, because that's one of the best ways that we can actually go through that teacher evaluation. So all of our teachers are asked to give 30% synchronous opportunities where they are online. You can do that teacher evaluation because you've got a live aspect rather than it just being recorded. And you see more of that uh, student pupil, uh, student teacher um, relationship that's been developed so that you can take off some of those additional boxes. So PPM 167, what did it say? Uh, it said students who entered from grade nine, they had to get two online learning credits. So we are planning for a significant increase over the next two years. Um, the grade nine students obviously then have just gone into grade 11. Um, so grade 11 and grade 12, we're already beginning to see the upturn. Uh, but in terms of our planning, uh, we are looking at around about 150% increase um, on this year's numbers for next year. Uh, our half year numbers that we're at right now is approximately 57,000 students. So with 150% increase, that's going to be considerable. Um, so that's one of the, the, the key parts. As I've said, parent and guardians do have an opt-out option. Um, the opt-out option does not stop the student from taking the e-learning credit. So if along the road, the student still decides I want to take an e-learning credit, they can do a little bit of What many boards are actually doing is rather than doing an opt-out option at the beginning, they're actually turning around and saying, look, let's just keep it open 
And at the end of grade 12, if you've not got the e-learning credit, we can just sign off on this piece of paper and hey, presto, no harm, no foul, you still get to graduate. So there's different ways that we can approach that. What PPM 167 also said, um, just uh, one word, that's it. Um, we have another model in Ontario, which is called remote learning. So online learning can be asynchronous, where remote learning cannot. Remote learning is actually what was set up for the pandemic period, and it requires 75% of time to be synchronous. So 75% of every single lesson, and the lesson has to be synchronous. The students cannot engage at a different time that the lesson isn't running. It's there, it's live, it's synchronous, 75% teaching time. And then the last one on this slide, Randy, uh, courses are available from grades nine to 12. There is leeway there for students in grade eight called Reach Ahead. So you can have a grade eight student begin their e-learning requirements, um, but it's only courses grade nine to 12 that are covered by what we're saying. Um, the most crucial part of what we were able to ensure, and this is how we work. I, I am the executive director of Ontario's e-learning consortium for English speaking boards. That's Catholic and public provided education, but only in English speaking. We have 55 boards that are members. Each of those boards do their thing. We just basically bring them all together. So everything that we do is about teaching local, but providing that opportunity to learn globally. So we're maintaining those sections at the school board level, which means the unions are happy, the teachers are happy, but the students get to experience a variety of different opportunities from a variety of different places. And when you actually look at the size of Ontario, that can be significant for a rural student, uh, an indigenous student, a, a suburban and urban student, getting those experiences to learn in different locations is part of that hidden curriculum. It really is that. Claude? Yes, so yeah, um, so yeah, most Ontario school boards are, are members of uh, the e-learning school board consortia that support greater access to a variety of online uh, courses for students. Uh, and that is the case for, for um, uh, uh, the English school boards, uh, they're not all part of the consortia, but for the, uh, the French school boards, we only have 12 in Ontario. Uh, and we're talking about only about 4,000 uh, credits issued per year, not 57,000 like, like John. So the 12 French school boards are, are part of the, uh, are associated with uh, Kevin Full. Uh, so yeah, courses are delivered through the provincial uh, D2L Brightspace uh, to which all teachers in uh, publicly funded Ontario schools have access. So they actually have access to that uh, space where uh, uh, courses are available, even if they're not following online courses, they still have access to these courses if they do certain activities that are associated with courses, they can uh, integrate them into the classroom. But nonetheless, uh, we use these courses for, for e-learning. And then the content for Ontario courses are produced for uh, D2L Brightspace. Uh, has been provided to Ontario school boards and teachers by the Ministry of Education for use in online and blending learning, like I, I mentioned. So courses are now uh, being written and made available by TVO. So 30 courses recently released with short and long-term plans uh, for continued course writing and production. Uh, samples are available to view at, at the address listed in, on the slide. And uh, for the uh, French part, while well, courses are, are now course development and revamping, for the French language uh, school boards are now being overseen by the Kevin Info. Uh, like John mentioned before, it, there was like a, like a privatization and we're going towards privatization in terms of a course development uh, with TVO, but now they, they gave the, the responsibility to the school boards to develop uh, courses. So the Kevin Info is overseeing that, uh, but we are working with the partners, uh, which is uh, the CFORP and TFO, which are C4 has been around for quite some time and have been uh, have quite a bit of experience in course development. But now what happens is that teachers from the Kevin Full from the consortium are actually involved in the content va validation. So once the courses are developed, uh, they're a lot more accessible or, uh, or interactive. So they're yeah, more interesting for the students. So that's that's a big plus for, for us now to be involved in that. 
course development and uh, revamping. So in terms of revamping, it's like the older courses, some courses are seven to 10 years old, but uh, the curriculum hasn't changed. But we're trying to update the activities, like I said, and make it more interactive. And a lot of these courses add outside links and uh, those links weren't uh, uh, functional anymore. So now we're trying to have more of a standalone courses where uh, we don't necessarily need access to uh, uh, links to YouTube or other outside links where those those can break and then it, it affects it affects uh, course delivery. I should just add on to that as well. Um, so within the constitution, both the English language and French language is uh, enshrined. But in addition to that, faith-based education uh, is enshrined into the Ontario constitution. So the Catholic school boards um, actually run separately and the TVO um, product uh, did not incorporate any faith-based education. So much like Cavill Flow, uh, the Catholic-based group, uh, which is Catholic Virtual Ontario, have also been given the opportunity to take uh, the courses that were developed by TVO and uh, add that faith aspect that was missing from those TVO pieces. Um, as a result, in all honesty, I, I would say, having seen the Cavill Flow and the, T, uh, and the CVO uh, produced documents, uh, they've actually got um, a much better product at the end of it. Um, and we are now lobbying actually to enable the, the public English speaking side to be able to do the same uh, and get some funding to actually improve what TVO has done. The TVO courses are a good starting point, but um, they, they do lack a, a few vital and important areas that uh, Cavalflow and CVO have been able to highlight. But that's one of the, the dangers of that centralization piece. Um, that we really did highlight, uh, and luckily, uh, ministry so far has responded positively towards it. Okay, thanks, folks. And I think we want to probably ask some questions at this point because Ontario is very different in terms of its approach and has had. I know that we'll hear from Frank and now Daylene Laman has joined as well from uh, Western side. The, the affordances provided in the province of Ontario do not exist in Western Canada provinces. So there is no centralized curriculum developed. There is no centralized LMS that people can use. I don't know, Karen, is there anything else that you want to? Well, I mean, the LMS is coming in for the polls. Yeah. In BC. So Brightspace, but you have to pay for it. 10 bucks a student. 10 bucks a student, whereas in Ontario, they pay nothing. And As a matter depending of fact, if the student okay. is cross enrolling, like if the student's taking courses in two, uh, schools that are using Brightspace, it's whichever school registers that student first has to pay the $10, and then the other school gets that student for free. So, so, so would, student, not for sorry, and we'll, we'll get into some more details when we get into to, to the, the Western side, but I just wanted to, to sort of make that point. But that's also the centralized thinking uh, historically uh, from, from governments has been towards a correspondence style of model. Whereas they get the content out, it covers the curricular objectives, but it's not necessarily effective instructional design or pedagogy for engaging students. And as you well know, Florida Virtual Schools have a history of developing courses that force engagement teachers into different instructional models, which are appropriate for online. So I just, so Michael, is there anything else to add in on that? Because John, you kind of poked that question as well about the improvements needed to be more effective for online around the development. And, you, and that rests best with the educator, not with the ministry, uh, ministry official. I guess the only thing I would add, you know, John had mentioned how um, when the mandatory requirement came in, um, parent groups and unions and others got, uh, you know, were, were essentially arguing against it. And one of the things I want to underscore uh, about that is the fact that um, I think it was largely due to, well, A, the fact that they didn't think it should be mandatory, which in all honesty is someone who's been researching this for over two decades. I don't think it should be either, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but the main reason was the way in which the ministry was going about it in terms of the centralization aspect of it, the fact that they were taking the teaching and learning out of the school board's hands. Um, and I, I reference that in particular because 
uh, one of the biggest differences we see between Canada and the US for those in the, our American colleagues in the audience is that across Canada, unions have tended to be quite supportive of virtual schooling, um, virtual learning across the country. Um, they do pay attention to what it means for their members in terms of quality of life and equitable workload conditions um, for an online teacher compared to a face-to-face -face teacher. But for the most part, they have, um, in fact, the, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation still has a resolution on its books and have since 2011, suggesting that every single student in the province should have the opportunity to learn online if they wanted to. Um, you know, so they see it as a fundamental right that if this is appropriate for a child, based upon, you know, what the parent wants and what the teachers, you know, figure, that they should have access to it. Uh, ADLC had a, a similar resolution that was passed in 2016, or not ADLC, sorry, the Alberta Teachers Association uh, had a similar resolution that they passed in 2016. Um, so teachers have tended, or unions have tended to be quite supportive of online learning across the country. Um, this was, I think, one of the rare exceptions, and I think it was more the mechanics of how it was being done, not necessarily uh, just online learning in general, whereas in the U.S., unions have tended to be quite, um, quite against and quite negatively disposed to online learning. John, you're nodding your head, so, okay. Go ahead. Um, so, well, first of all, in Florida, we do have an online course requirement for graduation. It just, it's not a full credit. It has to be at least a half credit. But out of curiosity, before this um, PPM 167 was enacted, what was the rate of opting out even before and after, I guess, this was enacted? Is there any data collected? I'm just curious to know how many students slash parents decided this is not for them. If I can, yeah, um, be before the PPM 167, there was no, uh, students were just taking online courses. Example, if uh, they lived in a remote region and uh, they didn't have that much course selection, then obviously they, they had the opportunity to take an online course, either with OELC or Kevin Full for, for the French uh, counterpart. Um, in terms of opting out options, um, we're actually just collecting now data from, from uh, the different schools. And honestly, some schools, it's like within the same school board will be 80% opt out. Some of them will be 30% opt out. So now what we're doing at the Kevin Full, we're, um, we met with all the uh, representatives, all the principals actually from the school boards. Again, we only have, um, we don't have a lot of other schools like uh, John has to manage, but. Um, so we met and uh, we have um, key messages that we deliver to the school boards, to the principals, just to promote online uh, learning, because obviously there are some advantages. Uh, we see the use of uh, the Bright Space, Bright Space platform at the college level, university level. So obviously, yeah, the, the students can develop some skills doing online learning. So we do, we do promote it. But yeah, for, for the opt-out, I think we're, the next couple of years, we'll see an increase, obviously, in student uh, participation, with online learning. Uh, but uh, before the numbers stabilize, it, it might take a couple of years. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, John. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because there are other things now that are beginning to come into play as well. So um, there is, um, by region, uh, some union activity to try and encourage opt out, um, which we've been aware of. So even though it's enshrined within um, their resolution, the fact that you have that opt out, they make it clear that you can still take an e-learning course, even if you opt out. Um, and that is the, the whole key to all of it. One of the, um, the separate issues, though, that's now beginning to arise is the old diversity, equity, and inclusion piece. Um, and that's being argued and used as a tool both for and against online learning. Um, so we're beginning to see now that start to rear um, its very important questions um, in terms of you know, accessibility and technology, but also in terms of um, students being able to access these courses because when you think of, of the uh, low economic uh, social areas, um, our BIPOC students, they tend to struggle actually attending school. 
um, because they have other things that they're needing to do. In many cases, you know, students from low economic circumstances are the key um, earners for their families. So they're actually working during school time. And so the whole school system as it stands currently causes an issue for them that they don't get ac equitable access to schooling because they're having to go out to work. So that's one of the pieces that's actually being used as, a, as quite a strong argument right now um, for um, the support of online learning within the province and the whole equity and diversity piece that is included within that. Yeah, numerically speaking, I can add that historically Ontario has tended to be roughly at the national average, whereas if you uh, go back to the, the slide and you don't have to there, Randy, because it's, you know, in the book that folks can look up in the report. Um, right now, they're a little bit above national average and have, with the requirement, have the potential to be basically half of what we do across the country. Um, but normally they would be roughly at, you know, five to six percent uh, of students taking it. Any other questions? So uh, I also just listening to the Ontario experience um, and really getting an idea of just how challenging the equity piece must be. So with this push, um, from my perspective, teaching multiple modalities in my community college district to meet student needs, um, I think that providing the choice can address an equity piece in terms of access and accessibility. But how has your province ensured that the financial equity piece as we've had more students move to take these courses on board? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had an earlier PPM called PPM 164, uh, 164 sorry, which has not been rescinded. Um, so any student that doesn't have technology or an, doesn't have access to technology at home can actually ask the school board for technology to be able to work from home and the school board legally has to provide that technology. So there is still that element that's out there. Um, and then in terms of internet activity, the same thing applies. Uh, the school board um, has additional funding to provide remote learning. But there's also been some interesting things like um, you know, partnerships with uh, local um, libraries, uh, even in some cases, Tim Hortons, um, where they've provided the internet access for the students and allowed them to go there and, and access the internet to be able to do work. So there's that partnership piece that's been crucial uh, to support that equity piece. And if I could add to that, one of the other things that we've seen shortly after the announcement, um, before it actually became part of, actually before PPM 167 was released, you started to see some investment of upgrading just the, uh, in terms of public-private partnerships, upgrading the bandwidth and the access to uh, high quality internet, uh, particularly in Northern Ontario and some of the rural areas. Um, so it, it's, it's one of these things that oftentimes, you know, that it takes a government initiative to spur the subsequent secondary investments to make sure that it becomes available, as opposed to the, the other option, which would be waiting until everyone had the ability to take advantage of it before you actually make the announcement and make the, you know, implement the policy. Thank you. Okay. And if I just want to add, I think uh, as a consortium, we have to advocate to and uh, the school boards have to advocate because ministry, and it might be the same in the US, oftentimes when there's like a new initiative, there is some initial funding. And then after a certain time, they kind of expect you to be self-sufficient. Um, so yeah, we always have to, uh, to make sure that the funds, uh, uh, that we keep get the funds uh, available to to maintain online coursing or courses. Yeah, it's good to hear though that there has been additional funding, even if it's you know to support the initiative initially. So I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But again, the public announcements versus the actual are often quite different. <laughs> um, so I heard you kind of say there is one entity that's creating this curriculum. Is this a curriculum that has? lessons and assessments or teachers in each province kind of getting a little bit of independence on how they're using it. 
it, it's very different. So let's just keep our conversation to Ontario. So, so John, do you want to tackle a little bit more detail about the curriculum that is developed? I know that the ministry hires teachers in the summer to create some courses. So uh, TVO, uh, Television Ontario, um, are the organization that is meant to be developing content. Um, they have developed so far 30 courses um, out of a possible 149. I think the last count that I remember, uh, online courses that are available currently, or at least that we offer currently. Um, so there's only actually 30 courses that have had content written for them so far. They are written by teachers, um, and they have um, a great deal of higher level content than before. You know, the, the levels of HTML5, the interactivity, the Web 2.0 pieces that are in there are, are better than. Um, a lot of the stuff that teachers created themselves but crucially what the government has enabled is all of this content can be edited so that's been the key part and within ontario it's really really important which is why you've got cavil flow being able to edit that content and create the additional uh, and refine it into what really is a great product rather than a good product same with CVO, they've taken the content that's there, they've edited it, they've added their faith-based aspects, and from that they've been able to then produce a great content instead of a good content. With the public teachers, we just do it organically in any case, we're not getting um, any additional monies for that, um, but you know what teachers are like, they see a product and they want to fine-tune it, they want to improve it, they want to have what's best for their kids. And so it is happening organically. And that's the flexibility of keeping that course open uh, rather than locking it down and forcing everybody to teach exactly the same. Um, so that's been one of the, the key benefits of it. But it would be nice if uh, the ministry sort of handed us a little bit more. But yeah, teachers are involved from the get go. Uh, there is a course writing group. Uh, and then there's also an administration uh, group that do a, a review uh, on the courses before they're released. Great. And actually, Randy, if I could just add, this is actually how Ontario originally, at least at the ministry level, got involved in online learning. Um, and 95 was the first online program in, in Ontario. By 2005, there were just around 20, 22 of them. And the ministry basically said to them, like, you know, we're going to take all of your content because there's no reason why we need 20 versions of a, a math nine course or, a, you know, a, a social studies 10 course. And they basically seconded a whole whack of teachers over a three year period and took everyone's content and created these master courses that they provided then back to the school districts uh, free of charge. Uh, and that's really how the ministry first got involved in in in, in Ontario in general. Um, and it's one of the only provinces where that's happened. Um, but it's how the system became more of a, a, a centralized system because, you know, as, as John and Claude have described, you know, while the school boards are the ones that are actually delivering it, most of the resources are being provided centrally. And that's where that all started was around course content because they saw such a a, a dramatic duplication of resources that were happening around course content creation. And uh, that's also when Ontario and it centralized uh, created a master user agreement, which then had certain requirements in terms of and expectations that were laid out, but also put some money in uh, with the centralized content, centralized uh, LMS, as well as uh, a district contact in each of the school boards for support for using uh, technology and online unlike other provinces, and let's make that the segue into the West, because <laughs> I'm sure, Frank, there's a little bit of, and Daylene, there's a little bit of fodder. And Daylene, maybe a quick introduction to yourself for the group here. Oh, sure, thanks, and apologies again for, for arriving a bit late. My name is Daylene Lawman, and I'm head of school and principal at Ignite Center for E-Learning and Independent School in Alberta. Uh, prior to that role, I, I worked at the ministry <clears throat> as the online learning advisor and uh, in other online learning programs within the province. And I've done some work over the years with Frank and the team at Vista Virtual and formerly ADLC. Um, and yeah, I just appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about partly what I, I learned and um, in my work at the ministry and working with a number of different school authorities and schools throughout the province. And uh, 
and how things kind of shifted and moved from prior to when I was at the ministry starting in 2016 until now. So appreciate the opportunity to be here. So, I, think do, I think we do want to give Daylene as much opportunity as she can because Alberta has been an outlier in a lot of this stuff. As we talk about greater centralization, Alberta has gone in the opposite direction, which yeah. to anybody who's Canadian would not be the least bit surprised by that. So mm -hmm. that's just the nature of the province. I do want to comment a little bit about what's happening on either side. And then I believe uh, Randy has a number of slides around the, the Alberta context. So just to kind of give you a geographic scope, because... Uh, probably people don't know, but you got uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, that roughly corresponds to Washington State, Montana, North Dakota. So if you can kind of situate that, Alberta's in the middle, and you got Saskatchewan and British Columbia on either side. Saskatchewan and British Columbia are moving towards some greater centralization. That varies a lot between those two jurisdictions. With British Columbia, you're largely looking at, um, and I think has been mentioned before, some sort of sharing of infrastructure. So, you know, a provincial LMS that will be accessible, although accessible at a fee. Saskatchewan is going in uh, a very, very formalized direction. With Saskatchewan, they are just in the process of establishing a crown corporation to act as their central clearinghouse for K-12 uh, distance learning. Now, they haven't set any parameters for that yet. They haven't got their funding parameters set, how their registrations are going to work. They've just said, this is the direction we want to go. And they are just literally now starting to construct that uh, Crown Corporation to act as their central clearinghouse for um, online learning in Saskatchewan. If I can add on that, is that they've adopted the uh, program essentially which already was in operation in the province, the SunWest uh, School Division's online uh, session. Uh, and so they've also seconded into the Crown Corporation, the superintendent of that school division, so that essentially they are adopting an existing program and making it the centralized platform as opposed to creating something new. And they're bringing all the teachers in, I think, to a certain extent, right, Frank? You bet. And I've had, I've had a few brief conversations with that uh, with that teacher leader about um, sort of the pitfalls around Alberta, because Alberta used to have a very centralized um, body called the Alberta Distance Learning Center. And I think at this point, Randy, it'd be wise to bring up the, the PowerPoint presentation and uh, I'll turn it over to Daylene to kind of delve into what's been happening in Alberta. Thanks, Frank, and jump in anytime. So there you see the geographic situation of Alberta and a little bit from the State of the Nation report, the um, our population and so forth and relative to the number of students who are enrolled currently approximately in online learning programs. And when I was at the ministry, I spent a lot of time in the data and providing that data to uh, Michael and Randy for the State of the Nation report because I thought it was important to make sure that we're highlighting the activity in Alberta. So you can go on to the next slide there, Randy. So this sort of gives you a bit of a lay of the land of where we're at right now. So, and, and Michael references the mid nineties. In the mid nineties, really ADLC, um, which came about uh, really uh, the Alberta Distance Learning Center um, was originally a branch out of Alberta Education, the correspondence branch that started in 1923 to address rural populations that didn't have equitable access to uh, education. So that's where distance education really was born out of and the Alberta Distance Learning Center was born. Since then though, um, since the mid nineties, uh, a number of other programs have cropped up in the province. So that really was uh, the essence of sort of a, the government having a role in the centralization of distance learning for a number of years. And then the landscape evolved and what we see now, um, and I'll just share my screen really quickly. When I was at the, uh, is that okay Randy, if I go ahead and do that? Okay, um, here, I'll just share really quick. What you see now, and when I was at the ministry, what I heard from the minister's youth council when I worked there and other families in my work is that they wanted to know what resources were available out there. So what you see here now is a directory where students and families can access all of the programs in Alberta, many of which do provide programming outside their school division, but some don't. They're really inward focused and servicing, and that seems to be becoming more the, um, the, the rule is that most school authorities are really interested in supporting their own students and less so outside. Um, about, a, I would say about a quarter of these are private schools, they're independent schools, and many serve large school divisions. Province-wide, um, 
Vista Virtual for sure. And Frank is the one of the uh, assistant principals there um, can speak to that. They have the largest population of students in the province serving mostly concurrent students, but also some private or some um, uh, full-time students as well. But we do, we've got about 46 programs in the province and this online learning directory just describes how their programming is offered many to adult learners and so forth. And then at the bottom of the page, You'll see the online learning guides that we developed while I was there. And I want to give a shout out to Joe Friedhoff and the folks at Miss Michigan Virtual for helping us get those off the ground so we didn't have to start from scratch. Um, there were some really good research based practices and pedagogy um, around for, for school authority leaders and so forth, and also around uh, developing our guides for students and families. So go ahead and just reshare, Randy, the, the slide deck that you had up there. That's it. You look really live there in that picture, Randy. It's, <laughs> you look actually real in your profile photo. I so, Yeah. And what you, <clears throat> about, there was a time when the province was kind of split between using Brightspace D2L and Moodle. And now there's really quite a variety. And Frank spoke to the site-based kind of management that exists in school authorities throughout the province. The, the ministry really has little role in providing oversight other than through how we're funded and so forth and through distance education programming. Um, and of course, the majority of students are registered in high school in online learning with uh, you know a handful, again, maybe a quarter of those students in grades one to nine. Um, we can jump to the next uh, slide there, Randy. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so funding again is really primarily based on completions and um, is it, and the number of course completions and credits as we as we use in Alberta are capped at a certain level and there's been some controversy around that. Of course, we have a number of students through COVID who are needing to take longer to finish their high school programming, and the caps at the fourth and fifth year level or fourth and fifth year students are really making it difficult for them to access, have that equitable access to completing their high school program. Um, there is some sharing, grassroots sharing, and actually in our guide to education um, in Alberta, school authorities who receive distance education funding are actually required to share their resources with others who ask for them. So that is one role that the ministry has played in ensuring that there is, um, you know, there's access to quality resources. And really, when I was at the ministry, what we saw is that all of the different school divisions had such different contexts. So to be able to modify those resources to meet the needs of their individual contexts, I know it was a challenge in some other um, jurisdictions where, you know, here's your course, use it, and the, the ability to modify them are limited, which can make that challenging. And then, um, and of course, from a legislative standpoint, we do have the professional practice standards for certification for teachers, for principals, and for superintendents, and all teachers, whether they're in a distance education program or in any other program, are required to meet the, um, the competencies that are highlighted or, or that are basically um, prescribed in the professional practice standards. So I think that was about it. Was there another slide there, Randy? Um, no. Yeah, so Frank, did you wanna add anything else to that? That sort of captures the basic, you know, the gist of what's happening in Alberta right now. I didn't, I didn't have anything to add. I, I do, I am mindful of the time though. And there were yeah. a couple of questions that I highlighted uh, early on when people came into the session that I'm going to speak in parentheses now, so I'm kind of going off topic. But um, you, I had, there was a question earlier about teacher evaluation. Um, we are in an asynchronous environment. We can generate a load of data to determine what a teacher is doing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how they're working in the LMS, how they're working in our email system, how they're working in our student information system. But at the core of it, our teacher evaluation is still largely uh, observational. Uh, our administrators will actually sit with the teacher for a couple of days, just as you would in a classroom, but they are sitting with them to observe their their day to day practice and how they're actually doing what it is they do. Um, so it's that combination of data, uh, but also still direct observation. There's there's just no substitute for that. Uh, in terms of somebody who's mentioning uh, what models are out there and what are the challenges. So as I mentioned, we work on an asynchronous model, which is great in terms of students accessing um, course material, it's really challenging in terms of self-regulation. And so our work at our school for the past 
year or so has been to really establish and set deadlines and course dates that will allow students to be successful. And that has been a challenge because we've been very, very flexible, very asynchronous, and you know we've kind of capped down on that quite a bit. And we've seen our success rates go up, but it's been a bit of a, a teething process. Okay, anything else to add? Uh I was going to jump in on the Frank mentioned about the teacher evaluation. One of the things I will mention is that in many jurisdictions, the majority of online teachers also teach in the classroom. So for contractual teacher evaluations, in many cases, their only focus is upon what's done in the classroom. So the, the evaluators, oftentimes, if you're teaching one or two classes online and two or three or four classes in the classroom, the teacher, your, your administrator just focuses upon your classroom teaching and not your online teaching. So, Daniel. I just don't want to add my experience. Fair enough, I mean, community colleges in Arizona so is a little different. But for my asynchronous classes, so for first, second, third year probationary faculty, we used to have five year probationary degree. Um, so for the first three years, we're getting up to four formal observations each semester. And in an observation where they're looking at like an asynchronous class, they're basically, we use Canvas as our solid LMS, and they're literally in the nicest possible way, respectful possible way. Uh, tearing it down to make sure that you are on it, to make sure you communicate with your students, to make sure there's the individual communication piece. And most importantly, again, completions, I mentioned someone, as someone mentioned that's an important measure of funding even, but for us, I mean, retention is the key thing and seeing that data is evident whether you're doing it by the person, which is direct observation, or again, how you've designed your course. And from an instructional perspective, for someone who was an administrator in Australia from the United States, um, certainly for me, as long as you've got reflective staff, and that's always the challenge, right? <laughs> but if you're reflective on it, there's a respectful dynamic, even an asynchronous class can be reviewed that way to maintain that to um, instructional quality. Yeah, yeah. And what you can see in our professional practice standards here in Alberta, like again, it wouldn't matter if you're in an asynchronous, a synchronous um, online environment or a classroom. We have six competencies in the teaching quality standard. And you can see how these would apply across the teaching profession, whether no matter if you're teaching, we say whether you're teaching on the moon or in an online classroom or, in, or wherever, um, all of these competencies teachers are required to, to demonstrate within their professional practice. So it doesn't matter where they're teaching. And, and this is what we base our um, coaching and evaluating supervision and evaluation on. And I know in other sessions that, that I've attended as well, that whole issue about what do you do with the contracted part-time staff? Do you teach them, uh, evaluate them differently? Or do you have the same set of standards in the NSQL standards as well as quality matters that give some guidance in terms of where and how that evaluation may be? It's, it's, it's a bit challenging in the sense that um, there are particular skill differences. And the, the part that I think is, is interesting is that it's actually starting to be recognized within the system that there's a different skill set required for online. Um, I, I'm not sure whether, Karen, whether there's anything else that we, we got that instant in about British Columbia. It's also an outlier in the sense that Alberta is a switch that goes on and off. Uh, so they're centralized, then they're not centralized. Whereas in, in British Columbia, it's, it's much more of a slow burn kind of thing. And there's consortiums that have evolved to support as well now, maybe t tell a story about the whole the centralization initiative about the provincial online school providers. Maybe yeah, just... so our ministry put it in, I think, two years ago yeah. that we needed to become provincial online schools. So schools that had existed already for 15, 20 years were now having to come under the standardized system. And so we had to fill out this 30 page application to just be allowed to keep doing what we're doing. Um, and they have focus groups where they were saying they, they had a bunch of LMS kind of come forward and say bid basically to be the provider for these provincial online schools. Um, and once you fill out the application, they did the public ones first, and then they did the independent ones after. Um, and after you fill out this application, now you have to meet all of these criteria, one of which is to transfer all of your data, student information courses into the chosen LMS, which is why space and pay for it. So we've spent the last 18 months moving all our courses out of Moodle 
and we're not getting paid to do any of this, <laughs> uh, but moving all of our courses out of Moodle into Brightspace, changing all of our systems and integrations and LTIs and training our teachers how to use it, training our students how to use it, parents how to use it, and now paying for that, just so that we can keep operating the way that we've been operating for 20 years. Um, and if you chose not to apply to become a provincial online school, you'd be restricted to students who live in the district where your physical, yeah. where you're situated. Geographic boundaries. Geographic, yeah. yeah. So our school is geographic, like we're a provincial school. We serve 7,000 students throughout British Columbia, but our head offices are in Kelowna, which is one city, and only 500 of the 7,000 students live there. So if we didn't go through this application, fill it out, be, become the provincial online school, we would be restricted to those type of things. So, so from a, an organizational perspective, is that BC opens up this corral gates and says, go wild, and then starts writing rules. And then, <laughs> so basically, and that's why, uh, as Michael will say, and says, is that BC is the most highly regulated, legislated, it's got the most rules of any province uh, basically, I think because of that notion of, oh, open it up, like, oh, no, wait a minute. Oh, God, we got to do that. <laughs> and they tried very hard. They, the ministry, when because I spent some time working with the ministry on a contract, um, thought quite there was only going to be two or three provincial online schools that are going to meet the, the mustard for it. Well, they boiled it down to the 16. 16 public. No, it's 18 public. 18 public. Right? Because they're different schools, but there's only 15 boards that are, that are involved in it. But they tried to get it down to like where it was before, back in the day in the correspondence, they had six regional offices which handled the online correspondence pieces, et cetera. I'm not sure. So it, it, it is, things aren't equal across Canada as a country, so. And curriculum in BC, like, do we have a free bank anywhere? Like WCLN is not. No, it's not, it's a consortium. It's, it's all purchase, right? It, well, it, you have to pay for that because they're paying teachers to do it. And so the provincial money doesn't go there. You had a question. I actually have a question yeah. for you. So, so when they enacted this, they're paying $10 per student, Who? where does that money come from? Is that from the school source? Is it something the parents pay for? Or? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, either we have to put it into our budget or we have to put it to our tuition model. Well, you were paying for Moodle report too. No, no, no. no. So, so that when they set the rules, it's like, okay, here's the hoop, here's the other hoop. So if you want to be a provincial online school and enroll students from outside of your geographic boundaries, which you don't have to do, but if you want to do it, oh wait, now you have to be in the provincial LMS, oh wait, now you get charged per kid, per kid. otherwise you cannot claim them for funding. So it's kind of this retroactive piece. I don't know, Michael, is there anything else to, to add on that? And I think maybe just a quick sum up. No, I've got nothing to add on, on that piece. I think you guys have covered it quite well. No, I've got something though, Randy, and that is what, what we find in Alberta, and I don't know if Daylene's running into the same issue, but I mean, as an online school, as predominantly an online school, we don't get any infrastructure funding at all. So we're basically required to, like, we have to have a warehouse, like we have textbooks, we still have these physical items. We still have staff who come in and uh, supervise exams. We, we have a physical plant. And yet that comes out of our instructional funding because there is no infrastructure funding for an online school because why would you need it? You're an online school. So that's a bit of a frustration. And not like, because as well, when, when you're working with ADLC, that infrastructure was paid through government grants and funding. And that's, I guess, one of the other things to, to add to it. You know, Randy talked about education in Canada being silos. Every single province would be set up very differently in, in that kind of respect. Um, like in theory in Ontario, when John has, you know, folks in Hamilton Wentworth that are enrolling students in Ottawa Carleton, they're supposed to transfer 700 odd dollars to each other per student per course. Um, and one of the advantages of John's consortium is the fact that they've just all agreed that eventually it's all going to wash. So we're not going to bother to transfer the money and close the consortium is the same thing, um, you know, creates it's more it's more it costs more to do all of the paperwork to charge all of the different districts that you're doing than it would be with the maximum amount of money you're going to bring in or, or send out um, the other thing to point out particularly for American audience in the room um, schools are funded very differently in Canada than they are in the U.S. Um, and it varies from from province to province so if you look at Atlantic Canada for example um, you don't get the same sort of per pupil funding that you would get in the U.S. for everything. 
Um, you know, like none of the folks here in, in the room when they're running their online programs have to worry about, you know, paying teacher salaries. Um, you know, that's all done centrally. Um, so you don't have a teacher that's paid in one district a certain amount and then paid, you know, $3,000 more in the district next door. Um, you know, it's, it's the same across the province and in many provinces paid directly from the ministry itself, not by the school district or any other authority. Uh, so when I was a teacher, um, our school, we had a school of 600 folks. We only had a budget of $13,000. But the only thing that our school actually had to fund was our consumables. So basically for us, it was mostly photocopy paper and donor. Um, everything else was paid centrally by the ministry, and we didn't see any of that. Um, it varies from province to province. So th what you'll find is in certain jurisdictions you get it. Um, but that's uh, the sort of the way it, it works, and it's one of the big differences. Okay. Hey, I'm just looking at the time, and I know that we have to wrap up here. Yes, Galen did say that it's a little different in Alberta. So it's different in each place. So uh, the one, one size fits all does certainly not apply across. Um, I want to thank our audience, certainly, for your questions and your involvement uh, through this. Uh, our online folks, thanks for beaming in, et cetera. And for those who are watching a recording, thanks for getting to the end of it. Um, so any, <laughs> any parting comments? Thank you. Um, really, really, thank you all. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of others that we're doing. Uh, uh, Michael mentioned the, the, uh, the poster session uh, this afternoon in the halls while I'm sitting down doing our pandemic pedagogy uh, as a table talk. Uh, but there's also a lot of this is on cannylearn.net for go to the projects, other sites that you can find as well. And then we're doing the design principles piece, picking up on the NSQL. Uh, crosswalks with Danielson framework, etc. So that's tomorrow morning that we'll be doing a contributed talk. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.